option as all panelists. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. David Taft. Dr. Taft is a professor at the Long Island University School of Pharmacy. He earned his bachelor's degree in pharmacy from the University of Rhode Island. He has a doctorate from the University of Connecticut. And his primary research area is pharmacokinetics with an emphasis on preclinical evaluation of drugs and drug candidates. David, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to him to begin the presentation. Well, thank you, Suzanne. And hello, everybody. Um, as, as my title indicates, I'm going to be presenting some, um, some of the research that's ongoing here at Long Island University dealing with um, using PBPK models to predict drug exposure um, during pregnancy. As far as where to get started, it, 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 it's a question that came into my mind is how prevalent is uh, drug use among pregnant patients? And being a parent, when my wife had three children, I didn't realize how prevalent medication use was, but it's actually quite prevalent that, um, as this slide indicates, that most women are prescribed at least one medication during pregnancy. And in fact, almost half of pregnant women, this is based on a study um, from 2011, and it's, it goes as far as, as 2008, that more than 50% of women take, more, take four or more medications during pregnancy. And so when you, when you think about that, it, it involves two different scenarios, and that is women who enter pregnancy um, on some chronic medication or women who develop a condition during pregnancy which requires um, medication therapy. And so what's listed here is on this slide is just some examples of classes of medications that pregnant women may take, and you see it covers a spectrum of antibiotics or, or CNS medications for epilepsy and depression, um, diabetic medications important, particularly for women that develop gestational diabetes, but there's a whole realm of, of medications that women may take. And in addition to that, pregnant women also take over-the-counter products and also herbal medications. So uh, medication use is, is, is quite prevalent among pregnant women. The issue really is, is that in terms of drug development that controlled clinical studies, uh, are generally not, not done with um, pregnant volunteers. So pregnant women are generally excluded from clinical trials. And in fact, less than one out of 10 approved medications actually have sufficient information to assess risk of birth defects. So what you have is you have a situation where um, pregnant women are prescribed uh, medications routinely, but they haven't really been tested in that, in that population. And what is well established at this point is, is that pregnancy is, is associated with um, numerous changes, whether they're anatomical, biochemical, or physiologic. And what these translate into are uh, changes in a drug's pharmacokinetics. So before I go into the, the changes in the pharmacokinetics uh, that could potentially happen to a medication during pregnancy, uh, the first point to discuss here is just to orient everyone into the, the general situation. Um, what this slide is showing for an oral dose, this is a plasma concentration versus time profile, which I think most people are familiar with. Um, the, the general measurements of the metrics that you, that you see here are certainly Cmax and AUC. If you look at guidance documents from the FDA, and, and maybe Health Canada and other regulatory agencies that the, the key measurements of systemic exposure are generally CMAX and AUC. Also a trough level may be important as well and we'll discuss that later, but the key um, equation on the right-hand side here in the, in the green box shows that the important pharmacokinetic parameters that dictate the relationship between AUC and the bioavailable dose, which is F times dose here, it's really the clearance of the drug. And so clearance is what you really have to be concerned with, um, particularly when you look at uh, changes, um, pregnancy-induced changes in pharmacokinetics. So as far as um, what these changes are, what I've broken down in the next series of slides is pharmacokinetics, uh, the acronym is ADME, A-D-M-E. And so there's been a, a couple of, several re review publications over the last, you know, several years, even going back 10 years now, that have, have summarized pharmacokinetic changes in, the, in this special population, which is pregnancy. And uh, one primary research group that's done a lot of work on uh, pregnancy effects is a group out of the University of Washington. And Mary Hebert has certainly um, been at the, at the forefront of this. So I'm, I'm referencing two of her um, publications, one going back to 2008 and one more, more recent. But um, just going through absorption first, these are the potential changes that can happen during pregnancy. And these can affect, for oral dosing particularly, either the rate 
or extent of absorption. So you have re, uh, delayed gastric emptying. You also have a reduced intestinal motility. Those can potentially affect or slow down the rate of drug absorption. But you also have situations, for example, altered activity of meta metabolic enzymes, whether they're, they're in the intestine or in the liver, um, which could also, that could certainly impact bioavailability or the extent of absorption. And then it's also been shown that transporter expression in the intestine, for example, PGP, is increased. And if you have increased PGP, that could result in reduced bioavailability through enhanced efflux. So you certainly have to be aware of the absorption um, changes. As far as distribution, um, it's anatomical changes that pregnant women tend to, tend to gain weight. There's an increased body fat. Um, there's also what's called hemodilution, in other words, that you have increase in total body water, an increase in plasma volume, increase in blood volume. The hematocrit of, of, the, of the blood is actually generally reduced. And you also have uh, reduced levels of circulating uh, plasma proteins with albumin and alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, which could result in more an increased fraction unbound of drug. And so generally what that will show is that will tend to increase a drug's volume and distribution. I'll also point out, though, that in pharmacokinetics, I think people are well aware that protein binding is, an, is, a, is a factor that can not only affect distribution, but can also affect clearance. And so even though it's not listed on the slide, is that the change in, in albumin concentrations, if the fraction unbound, the percent unbound of drug in the plasma is increased, that may theoretically allow more drug to be avail available for di distribution, but it also makes the drug potentially more available to get cleared. And I'll talk about that later on when I discuss one of the probe, probe medications that um, we modeled in this, in this research. As far as metabolism, uh, it's generally been um, established that there are numerous uh, enzymes, hepatic enzymes, where the um, activity is actually increased during pregnancy. Predominantly in the cytochrome P450 family, I've listed here uh, several isozymes. 3A4 is, is obviously a very important one. Also, in terms of uh, drug metabolism, there's, there's other enzyme families that are, that are important for drug metabolism. One is a conjugation reaction, which is, which is called glucuronidation. And one of the enzymes that mediates that is UGT1A1. So those are increased. And so what that would tend to result is an increase in hepatic clearance for a drug. On the other hand, though, CYP1A2, which is another drug metabolizing enzyme, activity is actually decreased during pregnancy. And then finally, cardiac output is known to be increased in pregnant patients, and so you'll have increased hepatic blood flow. And all that could also contribute to an increased hepatic clearance, and that would be particularly important for a high extraction ratio drug. An extraction ratio is really an indication of how efficient a medication is metabolized. So when you have high extraction ratio compounds, they tend to be dependent upon blood flow. And then finally, looking at drug excretion, and here I'm focusing primarily on the kidney, that again, cardiac output is increased, so you have increased blood flow. As a result of that, um, glomerular filtration rate, GFR, is also increased in pregnant women. And you also have, in terms of tubular secretion, and I'll talk about that in a moment, that transporters in the kidney, most notably what's called the cation transporter, OCT2, an organic anion transporter, OAT1, and also PGP, that trans, those transporters are expressed at a higher level during pregnancy, and that can also contribute to increased um, clearance. So what this, um, these, these general um, statements point to is that even though um, pregnant women are not generally in, included in clinical uh, trials, but they receive medications fairly routinely, you would expect that there's going to be um, pharmacokinetic changes in, in pregnant women. The other point to make with this in terms of clinical consequences is that it's not just you, you become pregnant and you have a change and that, and that change reverts back after, after pregnancy ends, is that these changes progress. Changes in pharmacokinetics are not constant. As you move from different trimesters of pregnancy, you see these changes actually, actually continue to evolve. And so that's something to certainly be aware of. It's not just being pregnant or non-pregnant. You should really look within the trimesters of pregnancy. And secondly, Generally speaking, that prescribers, without information available about effects of pregnancy on pharmacokinetics, treat pregnant patients generally with the usual adult dose. And if you have changes in exposure, that usual dose may result in subtherapeutic concentrations or potentially um, toxic levels, depending upon the magnitude and the direction of the change in the pharmacokinetics. So the key point is it's, it's important to understand how, these, how exposure changes during pregnancy in order to, to develop or identify um, evidence-based dosing regimens, appropriate dosing regimens for pregnant patients.
So with that, in that context, the question really becomes, what can be done? In other words, um, you're not going to necessarily conduct clinical trials on pregnant patients, but are there tools available to potentially allow um, some informed decision making in terms of dosing adjustments? And over the past 10 years or so, um, physiologic-based pharmacokinetic modeling, even though it's been in existence for decades in di different applications, particularly in the environmental sciences and toxicology, that is becoming more in the mainstream now in, in, in drug development and in pharmacokinetics. And particularly in terms of special populations such as pediatrics or children and, and pregnancy, this is where physiologic-based modeling is starting to take hold and being demonstrated to be um, informative in terms of changes in pharmacokinetics. So uh, just a general overview on this slide, it's a mechanistic-based approach. It considers the anatomy and physiology of the human body. It also requires um, information regarding the medication that you're studying, so physical chemical properties, as well as transporter and drug metabolism information. But the general model, and this was this is taken from uh, a publication about five years ago from um, Gahua and, and colleagues. This is the general uh, pregnancy PBPK model um, in 2012. This is really uh, based on what essentially what SIMSIP the SIMSIP platform um, in 2012, this is the model. And it's an extension of the 13 compartment model, but you'll notice here there's also the inclusion of a fetal placental unit. And inside that, combined into that, is not only the fetus, but also the placenta. So this is the model that allows um, some PBPK modeling of, of changes during pregnancy. And so um, the studies, the work that I'm showing today is really building upon um, some of the research that has been done over the past five or ten years. On this slide is certainly not all of the publications that are out there, but you'll see that um, there's been different applications. For example, in the top left corner here, it was a PBPK model, different medications that were metabolized by different um, enzyme pathways. Um, also, a more recent PBPK model of uh, antiviral therapy during pregnancy. And then below here again, this is a PB PBPK model with CYP3A4 substrates. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of this work has been done at universities, but there's been collaborations, for example, with some of the two of these, are, two of these references here. There's collaborations with the Satara scientists who are involved with SIMSIP. So our work is really an extension of what's already been done. As far as what I'm presenting today, uh, the specific aim is really to show how we've used PBPK modeling to describe pregnancy-induced changes for um, two probe medications that we've evaluated. One is azaltemavir, and the second one is tacrolimus. And so I'm going to show you how we've used PBPK, PB, PBPK modeling um, to evaluate those changes. And then additionally, um, my laboratory several years ago actually performed a similar study using GastroPlus, so I'm going to be able to show you or contrast with you or demonstrate how well uh, the predictability of these two different um, software plat platforms uh, perform with regard to these uh, medications. So as far as methodology, the, PB, the pregnancy PBPK mo model, essentially what it does is it takes the traditional PBPK model, but it factors in changes in, in, in physiologic and biochemical parameters or as a function of uh, gestational age. In other words, as pregnancy matures from the first to the second to the third trimester, these changes um, take place um, accordingly. And so what is shown here, again, this is from that um, Gahua reference, which is um, it's, a, it's a great uh, review article or if, you, if, if you're interested in it. I've just adapted um, the general predict equation that where X would be a certain parameter and some of the parameters are in the, the green and white box on the right, but it takes place, the X0 would be your baseline value before pregnancy, and then builds in as a function of gestational age, predicts the changes in these parameters. So it's done for all of the, the various physiologic parameters in the model, and then when you run the model, you can model, um, run the model in different pregnancy at different stages, different weeks of pregnancy, and it'll, it'll capture those changes, and then hopefully it'll be able to capture how that would affect or impact systemic exposure. So that's the general model that, that we used in SIMSIP, and our general approach is outlined um, here in these slides. In other words, we started with developing a model, and if you're not familiar with PBPK modeling, the model development certainly requires having all of that built-in um, physiologic, biochemical, all of those parameters built into the model. But other pieces of information that you need is the information about your substrate. And so, for example, the medications that we use in this research were tricrolimus and azaltemavir is that um, SIMSIP has a library of substrate compounds, and so that they've 
seeded the, the SimSip simulator with profiles for certain substrates, um, but azotemivir and tercolimus are not not part of that library. So some of the some of our research involved going into the literature and obtaining all of that information about physical chemical properties, um, enzyme kinetics, which enzymes are important, plasma binding, and all of that. So we we built those um, those profiles. But then the initial starting point is based on if there is published clinical data. For for the for the medication in in, in healthy uh, human human volunteers. In other words, the first step is to is to verify the performance of the model in, in healthy subjects. And what that involves is going into the literature and hopefully finding um, publications of uh, pharmacokinetics um, in humans. And if if available, and they were available for these medications, if they for example, presented a plasma concentration time profile for that drug, we're able to use what's called to digitize the graph. And in the top right-hand corner, I'm just showing an, an open source um, uh, digitize, digitizing uh, program. It's called Web Plot Digitizer. So you just upload your plot, and you can extract the, the concentration time data from that graph, and then you can use that to, to evaluate the predictability of your model. And so that was the first step to see how well our model predicted CMAX and AUC from that published data. And the, the red dot going back just indicates that if the, if the model didn't perform as well um, as we expected, we could go back and revise that model. And, and, and a useful tool in, in SimSip is something called parameter estimation. So in other words, you can actually do some curve fitting to get a better estimate of a certain parameter, for example, an absorption rate constant or something like that. So once we had the model verified for each, each probe, probe compound in healthy subjects, then what we did, and again, we, we based that on a fold error between CMAX and AUC of the observed versus predicted. Once we were confident we had a, a good model based on predictability, then we moved to, to the the pregnancy PBPK model, and we did simulations across different trimesters of pregnancy and compared that to postpartum. And so once again, how we evaluated the goodness of fit there or how well we predicted is to compare that to published data that's available for that medication in, in a pregnant population. And again, we, we then conducted not only the model verification based on fold error, but also if there are changes that these PBPK model, modeling software programs like SimSip give so much information about demographic information, about um, uh, you know, different physiologic parameters in the different simulated subjects like GFR or blood flow and other things, that you can, tr you, can, you can begin to go and probe what are the main causes for the differences in exposure, and that helps with better interpretation. And so moving on now, I'm, I'm going to present um, some of the results um, that we obtained with our probe compounds. And again, I'm presenting today um, just two of the compounds that we've studied, um, both interesting for different reasons. Uh, the first one is azeltemivir. Now, you may not know azeltemivir by its chemical name, but um, I think people may recognize its brand name. It's called Tamiflu. And this is an antiviral medication. Um, its indication is for the prevention and acute treatment of influenza. And the Centers, the Centers for Disease Control actually recommends that pregnant women with either suspected or confirmed influenza infection should be treated with, um, with Tamiflu, as in, in the opinion of the CDC, the benefits outweigh the potential risks. The interesting thing about azeltemivir in terms of using it in this model is that it's actually a prodrug, that azeltemivir, when it's, when it's administered orally, gets converted by hepatic carbo carboxylesterase enzymes into its active form, which is called azeltemivir carboxylate, or OC. That's the active form of the, of the medication. Now, azeltemivir carboxylate, um, its primary route of elimination is renal excretion. So you have hepatic conversion of the prodrug to the active form, and the active form undergoes renal excretion. And regarding renal excretion, and, and again, this slide shows the general setup here. In other words, um, renal excretion for drug, there are three general mechanisms that are involved in renal drug excretion. There are two, two ways that a drug can make its way into the urine from the, um, from the bloodstream. The first is filtration, and the driving force for filtration is the glomerular filtration rate, how the kidney filters the plasma. And that also depends upon um, only unbound drug. Any drug that's bound to plasma protein generally can't be filtered. That's not really an issue for azeltemivir carboxylate because the azeltemivir carboxylate really has minimal plasma binding. The second mechanism that a drug can make its way into the, into the urine is through active tubular secretion. This is an active um, mechanism where drug is taken up from the blood 
into the kidney cell and ultimately make, makes its way into the urine. And that's what's shown here on the left-hand side. This is a schematic of a proximal tubule cell. This is the blood side. And what you'll notice is that there's numerous transporters that can mediate drug uptake. A couple of them that I mentioned before when I talked about pregnancy-induced changes, the cation transporter OCT2, but also OAT1 or OAT1. This is an organic anion transporter, and azeltemivir carboxylate is actually an OAT1 substrate. So what you have here um, is that pregnancy may, may increase the expression of OAT1. Pregnancy is known to increase glomerular filtration rate. So those two things together point to perhaps an increased clearance in pregnant patients. Now, what's also shown here, and this is an issue for lipophilic medications, is that there's a third mechanism for drug handling in the kidney, and this is reabsorption. And what this, what this involves is that medication that gets filtered and secreted into the, into the urine can actually get reabsorbed back into the body. So it works against clearance. And this is, not a, this is generally not an issue for a, a substance like azeltemivir carboxylate. It's probably going to be almost negligible. Where this becomes important is when you have a lipophilic drug that may get filtered, may get secreted, but that reabsorption is primarily passive, that that drug is not going to get excreted, excuse me, excreted very well by the kidney. And so medications like that really require drug metabolism by the liver. But there are examples here, and I'm not going to discuss it today because it's not as relevant, but there are also transporters that exist on the urine side. And what you'll, what you'll see, for example, is um, there's a few that mediate drug um, excretion from the kidney into the urine, and one of them, for example, is PGP. There's also something called the, um, the, the, anti, the, the transport extrusion proteins, or MATE. So those can also be important, and certainly you may also have um, active reabsorption from the urine into the kidney cell. So again, it's not as um, critical for what I'm talking about today, but there's a lot of information available now about transporters. So again, with azeltemivir carboxylate, we're going to be concerned potentially with increased secretion through increased OAT1 activity and increased filtration. Now, where we start, again, going back to how we start with evaluating um, our model, we developed a model based on the, the SIMSIP pregnancy PBPK model, but our substrate profile. And so what we want to do first is, is see, um, validate or verify if our model is predicting exposure in healthy subjects. And so this is a paper that came out, I don't believe I have the, the full reference, but I think it was relative, maybe a year or so ago that looks, looking at the effect of um, hepatic impairment on azeltemivir pharmacokinetics. We were able to take data from that publication. In other words, this graph here, the open circles represent the um, azeltemivir carboxylate uh, profile in the control group. So even though this is a moderate hepatic impairment study, the control group was um, healthy volunteers. And so we were able to digitize that graph and, and estimate um, the CMAX and we also did, and, and look at the profile, but also reported here are the PK data for the, for the compound. And so this is the reported ozeltemivir. This is the, the, the prodrug. OC is the active form. So you see that there was information provided here. It was a study in 11 healthy volunteers. It was a single-dose study with sampling for 48 hours. And so what we wound up doing is we actually mimicked that study design in our model. So we, 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 we took the um, ozeltemivir profile for the, the carboxylate, and we ran a simulation of, of 10 volunteers. We did 10 replicates, and we did a 75 milligram once-a-day oral dose with sampling to 48 hours. And what's shown on the right-hand side here in this graph and it may be difficult to see, but the red circles actually represent the digitized data that we obtained from that publication. The solid dark line here is the predicted mean plasma concentration time profile from our simulations, and the, the dotted green lines here represent the 5th and 95th percentile. And so looking at the graph, what you see is we have a, a reasonable fit or, or prediction of the um, our model predicts the observed data reasonably well. We have a slightly um, faster absorption prediction compared to the observed data. But what you'll find if you look at the, the fold error and, and what that is, fold error is the ratio of the observed divided by the predicted uh, model predicted values for CMAX and AUC. And you see the fold error is quite low. So looking at this, we take this and we, we're, we're confident that we verified um, that our model for azeltemivir carboxylate um, is, is appropriate based on the healthy volunteers. I'll also point out that what that model involves is starting with the ozeltemivir and converting the carboxylate through the model using those the, the hepatic 
uh, carboxylesterase enzymes. And so we actually have the parent drug also built into the model. I just don't, I haven't shown the data here. So with that, now we want to look at how um, our model predicts um, per the performance of Oseltamivir across different trimesters of pregnancy, as well as postpartum. And so what postpartum is, it's the fourth trimester of pregnancy. What it represents is, is after, after birth, the period of time before um, the, the pregnant woman reverts back to physiology and, and all of it reverts back to, to normal. That's the postpartum period. And so what, what this is based upon, this is based upon a, a publication that was, um, and I'll show you that in a moment, uh, published data of clinical studies with oseltamivir in pregnant populations. But what we did is we ran, again, a 10 by 10 trial design, single dose data, but we ran it in, in four populations. So in SimSIP, we created four populations. T1 means first trimester of pregnancy, 10 to 14 weeks. Trimester 2, 22 to 26 weeks. Trimester 3, 34 to 36 weeks. And postpartum, which in this case, I believe was more than three months after delivery, and we use the healthy volunteers population of females to do that. And so what we did, again, we simulate the um, systemic exposure curve. We look at fold error in those key metrics, which are CMAX and AUC, and then we can look at some other data from the models to, um, to explain or try to correlate um, what's going on w with our findings. And so here is um, one of the publication that we relied upon, and the title is Pharmacokinetics of Oseltamivir According to Trimester of Pregnancy. If we're thinking about this, and again, um, one thing to point out, and it may be difficult to see here, but these graphs were obtained from that publication, that the left panel here is the Oseltamivir plasma concentration time data. The right-hand panel is the carboxylate. And what you'll see is that this is showing the three trimesters of pregnancy compared to um, uh, overall, and what it's showing here is that there's really no difference in pregnancy-wise in terms of the disposition of oseltamivir, whereas you see separation during pregnancy of the, of the metabolite. So generally speaking, pregnancy altered the, the disposition of the metabolite, but not the parent molecule. So we focused on the metabolite in our modeling. One of the key things, as I mentioned before with oseltamivir, one of the key pregnancy effects is going to be in terms of the excretion, that when you think about that metabolite, it's primarily excreted by the kidney, and we know that there's going to be increased GFR and potentially increased transporter expression with that organic anion transporter that may impact um, the pharmacokinetics of oseltamivir. So moving on, there are actually two different studies that are published for oseltamivir. The first one, as I mentioned uh, before, is looking at oseltamivir according to different trimesters of pregnancy. One of the problems or, or issues with that study is they did not include a postpartum treatment group. So it's just looking at pregnancy alone and not comparing it to a control group. And so um, we actually ran the simulation with postpartum, but we really couldn't um, evaluate its predictability because that information wasn't, a, wasn't provided in that reference. But there's a second reference um, that was published in 2011, and this is looking at uh, just a direct comparison of oseltamivir pharmacokinetics between pregnant patients and non-pregnant women. And so this study here, while they didn't separate by trimester, they grouped pregnant and non-pregnant, they grouped all the pregnant women together. What it does show is that there is um, an effect, a pregnancy effect compared, compared to normal or compared to healthy women. And what I've highlighted here, what you can see, if you can't really see it, it's showing a significant decrease in AUC during pregnancy and that's due to a significant um, increase in clearance during pregnancy. So what the um, Baigi uh, publication, this publication here shows, is that there's a 30-fold increase, 30% uh, increase in clearance during pregnancy. And now what we can take from that is we can use that to evaluate the postpartum group, but then we can also probe if there's differences among different trimesters of pregnancy in our model. And that's essentially what, what we've done. And so what I'm showing here is the predicted plasma concentration time profile for um, azeltamivir, 75 milligram single dose. In the top left corner is the first trimester, and then going the second trimester in the, in the top right. Bottom left is the third trimester, and then you have the postpartum. Notice here I don't have the open circles because they weren't available, but we do have um, data available to predict or to show um, the predictability of the model uh, for the three trimesters of pregnancy. And so again, the open circles represent the, um, the digitized data from the published um, graph from the publication. The solid blue or purple line is the predicted mean 
um, curve, and then you have the dotted lines, which are the 5th and 95th percentile. And so overall, um, it, it appears that we've captured the data reasonably well. Um, when I go to the next slide, I think, and I'll talk about it in a moment, but if you look, our AUC proje projection should hold up um, fairly well. When we look at the next table, though, these are the fold error, value, fold error values. And so even though the fold error predicts reasonably well for the first, second, and third trimester, you'll notice that the AUC varies between 1.3 as, as high as 1.86. When you look at the actual graph on the previous slide, it doesn't really, it's not consistent with that. We went further into the uh, publication, and what it appears to be is that publication reported, this is AUC from zero to 12 hours, and that's what they reported. But when you look at the, at the data, and when, when, you, when you measure the AUC from the digitized graph, it appears that what they're actually reporting is AUC zero to infinity. And so even though these fold errors seem reason, higher than what we'd expect, it's, it's my opinion based on what I've seen is that the publication just misreported AUC as AUC zero to infinity. I think the graphs, for example, on this previous slide show that we pretty much, we match the AUC 0 to 12 reasonably well. But what the data do show, it does show if you look at the AUC for the postpartum, it's around 1660, but that decreases to around 12 to 1300, particularly in the second and third trimester of pregnancy. And what that re referenced, the paper where we got the data from, um, I'm showing a quotation here that shows that they're indicating that there's reduced systemic exposure to the carboxylate, potentially increasing the dose and or dosing frequency may be necessary in order, in order to achieve comparable exposure in pregnant and non-pregnant women. So this is a recognition that potentially due to the increased clearance due to pregnancy, that it may necessitate an increased dose of azeltamivir in the pregnant population. Uh, our data is consistent with um, what may be pregnancy-induced changes either in GFR or, or transporter expression. What I'm showing on the right-hand side is the GFR results for the different trimesters of pregnancy compared to postpartum. And what you can certainly see is that particularly in the second and third trimester, you have an increased GFR or granular filtration rate in these women, and that's going to lead to an increased filtration and also an increased clearance of azeltamivir. So this is some of the information that you could obtain from the simulator that allows you to do some, some comparisons um, of how you look at your systemic exposure and try to relate it to some physiologic uh, changes. Uh, I haven't shown the OAT expression results, but that's other information that you could obtain from the simulator. So the key point is this is one example where we're able to take published data and demonstrate that the model, that the pregnancy PD PK model in SIMSIP is able, able to capture the changes in systemic exposure for azeltamivir carboxylate in pregnant population. I have a second um, example to go through, and that is uh, tracrolimus. And this is a very interesting um, medication. Uh, what is it used for? This is an example of a medication that a woman who enters pregnancy may be receiving this chronically, and perhaps that woman underwent an organ transplant, either a liver, a kidney, or heart transplant and enters pregnancy on, on sustained therapy of, of uh, trichrolimus to prevent um, organ rejection. The interesting thing about trichrolimus is it's got a very complicated pharmacokinetic profile. It has extensive red blood cell distribution. What I've shown here is the B, the B full colon BP, this is the blood to plasma ratio. And so what the blood to plasma ratio has been reported to be 15 or even higher, which means that if you took, did a study where you actually measured blood concentrations, and then at the same time separated the blood out and took a sample and, and measured plasma concentrations, you'd have a 15-fold difference in those values, where the plasma concentrations would be 15-fold lower. What, what is interesting about that is that if you look at the clearance of trichrolimus in the plasma, it's a high extraction ratio drug. When you look at it in the blood, it's a low extraction ratio drug. But another key part of this is that it has extensive plasma binding, probably 98-99% to alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, and also albumin. It's primarily metabolized in vivo. It's a substrate for CYP3A, 3A4. It has, very, it has relatively low oral bioavailability, around 20%. It's a narrow therapeutic range drug, and it's highly variable pharmacokinetics. So this is complicated, but it's also really interesting, and you can use SIMSIP and the pregnancy PBPK model not only to evaluate or predict um, systemic exposure, but you can also try to correlate what you're finding 
with some of the detailed information that the model provides. One thing to note here is that clinical studies with trecholamus generally, it's the blood concentrations that are monitored therapeutically, not the plasma. So our simulations, what I'm showing here, are the simulations in, in blood. And so again, the same general type of setup is that we started with um, data from healthy volunteers, and this was a study um, that was published that involved um, healthy volunteers. It was, it was a little bit different. It was an absorption study, but there was data from healthy volunteers. This was a single dose study, one milligram. Uh, we used a 10 by 10, in other words, 10 subjects. We ran a, a replicate 10, 10 time simulation, and we simulated the plasma concentration time profile. And I think when you look at the graph here on the right, again, the open circles are the digitized data from that publication. The solid line is our model predicted line, and then you have the fifth and 95th percentiles. And I think when you look at this, it's clear that our model is verified. We've got a reasonable prediction. We actually were able to capture the plasma concentration time profile, and that's backed up by um, the fold error here. I'll also point out, um, if you look at the observed and the predicted values for this one milligram dose, just to keep that in mind as we go forward, that the AUC is around 45. And it's going to be important when I'll come up to it uh, in a moment. But in contrast to azeltemivir, this is the issue during pregnancy. And so what I'm showing here, this is, this is a publication actually from the, um, the University of Washington group, which evaluated trecholomus pharmacokinetics during pregnancy compared to postpartum. It's a little more complicated in terms of the considerations you have to give during pregnancy. It's an oral dose, so pregnancy effects could potentially be altered enzymes, particularly CYP3A4. Um, trecholomus is a PGP substrate, so potentially increased transporter expression can in impact bioavailability. Certainly, the effects on hemodilution and volume expansion, given the extensive red blood cell distribution, this hemodilution could play a role. The drug is highly bound to plasma proteins, so reduced plasma concentrations could increase the fraction unbound of the drug. And then in metabolism in the liver, again, increased 3A4 activity could increase the clearance of trecholomus. So the, the, the setup here is that there's an expectation that you're probably going to see altered pharmacokinetics in pregnant populations, and those pharmacokinetic profiles will change as a function of um, trimester. And that's what we wanted to evaluate. And so again, taking that, that published data, running a very similar trial design, that that publication involved different maintenance doses of trecholomus, but they normalized everything to a one milligram dose in the, in the reported results. So in this case, we took a one milligram daily dose and modeled it to steady state. Again, we looked at four different populations, the three trimesters of pregnancy, and then the postpartum, because that data was reported. And again, we, we looked at how well um, the model captured CMAX and AUC data that was measured in those, in those um, study subjects. And again, trying to correlate that with the various information that you'd get out of your model. So here are our results. And again, this is a simulation to steady state. So I'm showing, what I'm showing here is after day two. And you'll see that steady state's pretty much reached at that point. And again, going around the top left is first trimester, top right, second trimester bottom left, third trimester, and then you've got the postpartum. And these graphs, what I did is I kept the scale the same so that you could, so that it would be allowed to, you could see the differences in magnitude. But one thing that clearly shows up or that you can see, the open circles are the, are the published data. And what you see is the model captured that data reasonably well. One of the issues that, you, that came up is that um, our postpartum model predictions are higher than what was observed um, in that clinical study. So well, I'll talk about that in a moment. Here's the table of the data. A couple of things to point out is that what you see, even if you look at the observed data, the AUC decreases significantly um, as you go towards particularly the second and third trimester of pregnancy. Uh, you might be looking at this screen and saying, wait a minute, why is 4.4 and 21.51 show up twice? It's because in, in the particular study, the investigators actually pulled the data from the second and third trimester. and so. Um, that's what's shown here. So even though we modeled the individual trimesters separately, what's shown here is, is what was reported. So they didn't separate it out. But either way, we have a reasonable, um, the fold errors are certainly within um, 20 to 30 percent here. You see a bigger gap, particularly in AUC here. And so we're assuming we're using a healthy population for the postpartum. And that's why I said, remember that 45, because that was what was shown roughly in the, in the healthy volunteer study 
that the observed data was much higher than what it is here. So we're assuming that this was about, I believe these, these postpartum patients were more than three months out after delivery. So we're assuming that they reverted back to normal baseline, but potentially that may be one explanation. But also it has to be pointed out that the data is highly variable for, um, for trichrolimus. But either way, what we're seeing is a significant reduction in exposure in, um, in pregnant patients. So two questions come up. First, what's the driving force behind these observations? What physiologic parameters are driving that? And second, what is the clinical significance? So we'll answer each of those questions individually. This is a little bit of a busy slide, but as far as potential factors that contribute to this reduced exposure or decreased AUC, what I'm showing here in the green box, this is generally, if you have a medication like trichrolimus that is given as an oral dose and it's primarily metabolized by the liver, this is, this is the equation for AUC for an oral dose. This is assuming the venous equilibration model. This is, you can find this in, in publication, published references, but what it describes is that the AUC will depend upon um, FA is the fraction of the, of the dose that was available for absorption in the GI tract. FG looks at fraction of the dose. It's re representative of intestinal, intestinal metabolism of the drug um, after, after uh, deliver, oral delivery. The dose is self-explanatory. The terms here, FU sub B is the fraction of drug unbound in the blood, and CLINT is the intrinsic clearance, the intrinsic hepatic clearance. So these are all the parameters that could be responsible for potential reasons why the AUC is decreased in the pregnant population. What, I'll, what I'm showing in the box above, potential causes, well, potentially perhaps increased peak glycoprotein could result in decreased bioavailability. That would show up in this FA term. I can tell you that we attempted to build in uh, a PGP effect for this, uh, for trichrolimus. We, there was no published information about the transporter kinetics, so we weren't able to capture that. So that remains a potential factor that we couldn't consider. Certainly reduced plasma binding, which would result in an increased fraction unbound in the blood. And then you also have potential effects of he, uh, hemodilution and anemia, and that's what's shown here, that the hematocrit decreases significantly, in the, um, particularly in the third trimester, and you have reduced um, albumin and alpha-1 acid glycoprotein concentrations. That will all affect fraction unbound in the blood, and then also potentially intrinsic clearance. So what I show here in the, in the, in the table at the bottom, this comes from SIMSIP. These are the predicted values for fraction absorbed, <clears throat> fraction escaping intestinal metabolism. What you'll see is there's not a big difference in the model predictions among these, suggesting that these terms here are not what's, are not what's driving the results. What you do see, though, though here is compared to postpartum, postpartum, a significant, much higher fraction unbound in the blood. Also point out that it's, it's more than 99% bound. So even though this is a small change in terms of the numerical difference, percent-wise it's fairly high. And so what we're showing is this is increasing during pregnancy. And also the intrinsic clearance, you, do, you also see potential uh, differences in pregnancy compared to postpartum. And this, the findings that these are the drivers, particularly the fraction unbound, is backed up by a study in the AAPS journal in 2014. That was a PBPK model study with trichrolimus and healthy volunteers. And what the modeling showed was that the plasma binding and the intrinsic clearance are the most important determinants of uh, variability and exposure. And that's consistent with what we have here. So it appears that the changes in binding um, are driving the reduced exposure of the drug. The question really becomes, the second question is, what's the clinical relevance? And so when you look at um, trichrolimus or, or other medications like that, it's not the total exposure that you have to be concerned about. It's the unbound uh, exposure. So here's a, here's a reference to a publication by Dr. Hebert and her colleagues at, at Was University of Washington. And the general idea here is, is that uh, a prescriber that's, that's monitoring total blood concentrations and would see the significant reduction in those levels during pregnancy would be motivated potentially to increase the dose of the drug. The issue though is that for a drug like trichrolimus, when you have um, high plasma binding, why that reduces the overall AUC of the drug, it doesn't really change the unbound concentration. I don't have it written, listed here, but there was a, a, a seminal paper that came out in uh, 2002 by Les Bennett at the University of California, San Francisco. It's in clinical pharma, pharmacology and therapeutics, and it really gives a real important overview. Uh, the title is 
changes in plasma binding have little clinical relevance. And it's really important in, in terms of this, this aspect of, our, of the work is that when you have a, a drug that's highly bound for an oral dose that's primarily cleared by the liver, when you have an increase in the fraction unbound, why that potentially would re result in reduced total exposure of the drug, the unbound exposure really doesn't change. And that's what Dr. Hebert is getting at and her colleagues in this publication that's in the box here, is that clinical tri titration of, of doses to maintain whole blood trichromous concentrations, this is talking about the trough, and the usual therapeutic range, if you do that, that could potentially lead to elevated unbound concentrations and possibly um, toxicity in pregnant women. And so what I'm showing here in this graph, this is actually the unbound. SimSIP allows you to do this, is actually look at the unbound concentrations. And what you'll find that during pregnancy, when corrected for binding, it's essentially the same. It might be slightly higher in postpartum, but the trough levels certainly are all matching up. And that's what's shown here, looking at the AUC and the trough levels for postpartum compared to pregnancy, it's actually showing that the, if the key driver or the key monitoring parameter is trough values, you really shouldn't increase the dose. And so this is an example here where SimSIP is, is providing evidence that supports um, what this publication shows, and it's consistent with um, pharmacokinetic theory. And, and I would, again, refer back uh, to the publication by Dr. Bennett. Just briefly, a question or a comparison to look at how does SimSIP compare to Gastro Plus? Um, my guess in talking to, um, to scientists, uh, particularly people at, at SimSIP, is that the platform Gastro Plus may rely on the same references as SimSIP for the physiologic, and, uh, physiologic changes during pregnancy. So it may be no surprise that the predictions for azaltemivir and trichrolimus match up pretty well between both um, platforms. Just to point out that where, we, where I obtained the Gastro Plus data is one of my former students, Rakesh Gawain. His thesis work involved modeling PK changes during pregnancy using Gastro Plus. And so overall, what you'll see is that the performance is comparable between, um, between both platforms. So just to conclude, um, a few things for going back to where I started. Um, Medication use in pregnancy is, is probably, at least in my mind, it's more prevalent than what, what, at least what I thought when I started this project. So pregnant women are receiving uh, multiple medications. Um, the issue is, is that those medications aren't necessarily um, tested in pregnant women in clinical trials, and so prescribers are relying, relying on um, usual adult doses uh, for, for the prescribing those. But it's known, as hopefully captured in this talk, that there's numerous changes physiologically, anatomically, biochemically, and during pregnancy that can alter drug disposition, and these changes progress as, as pregnancy progresses. Altered pharmacokinetics can potentially reduce efficacy or may result in toxicity in pregnant patients. And um, even though controlled studies aren't generally done, clinical studies on pregnant patients, uh, what this investigation hopefully demonstrates is that um, these PBPK pregnancy models are continued, continuing to evolve, they're robust, and they can be used uh, successfully to predict um, pharmacokinetics across different trimesters of pregnancy. Uh, just, to, the, just to show um, the compilation of information that's been obtained um, that's in the literature, the box below, these are numerous publications on pregnancy-induced changes, and these are some of the medications that have successfully demonstrated the use of pregnancy PBK, PBPK models for pregnancy for in, in uh, predicting in pregnant women. It covers a wide range of, of medications, including antivirals and, and cardiovascular drugs. The last step of what to talk about is where the future is going in terms of where I think P, pregnancy PBPK PK models are um, going to be extended to. And it really gets into what the FDA, um, a rule that the FDA um, finalized uh, over two years ago now. It's, it's called the Pregnancy Lactation and Labeling Rule. It's also called the Final Rule. And it's moving away from the, the traditional um, pregnancy uh, categories of risk to the fetus like A, B, um, the def different ratings, and wants more information. And so this is extracted directly from the um, the the, the, um, the the rule the FDA rule from the Federal Register and what it, what it's talking about is is that um, prescribers need need more information to make a, appropriate dosing decisions and this can include information on disease associated risk to the the mother or the fetus and so what I've shown at least through the modeling is you can certainly evaluate um, systemic exposure changes to the mother the question is um, can that be uh, extended to the fetus. 
And so what I'm showing here is just these are two manuscripts that have been published in the last um, six months, one more recent than the other. But this is um, the group out of Washington, Josh Indicat, and also Dr. Mendes, um, two different publications that now are taking the pregnancy PBPK model and then building in um, fetal exposure. In the one case, uh, modeling it for passive uh, permeability across the placenta, and in the second case, looking at um, different P, uh, P450 pathways, but really looking at not evaluating the exposure to the fetus. And so I know that SIMSIP is evolving, their models are evolving to, to provide more information about fetal exposure, but this is where potentially a very useful application of the tool to satisfy regulatory requirements with these new labeling changes would take place. And so I, I thank you for your time. And with that, uh, but just one thing I do want to acknowledge, I'm sorry about that, um, Satara, uh, we're part of, uh, Long Island University is part of the SIMSIP ac academic licensing program. So the support of Satara to allow us to use the SIMSIP simulator, but build it into our teaching and graduate education has been tremendous. So I can't thank them enough. And then obviously the students do all the work, so I want to give a, a acknowledgement to Vamshi Jogaraju and Savachala Avari. They did a lot of the groundwork and the modeling on this project. So with that, uh, thank you for your time. And Suzanne, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you so much, David. Um, please submit your, your questions in the Q&A box to, to Dr. Taft. Uh, looks like we have our first question from our, our audience. Um, speaking about the Tacrolimus example, someone would like to know how you calculated the fold changes in CMAX and AUC? Oh, well, well that, yeah, the fold changes, the way that's done is that you just take your, the observed, whatever the, the, the reported CMAX and AUC data from the publication and you compare that to the model predicted CMAX and AUC. So it's just the ratio of one number to another. Someone would like to know about your, your thoughts on uh, fetal drug exposure. Well, fetal drug exposure, I, I think that, you know, the, um, the science is evolving that the, it's, it's known, for example, that there may be transporters on the placenta that could either mediate or maybe even prevent drug accumulation to the fetus. Certain medications, I know that there's been research done to um, evaluate or, or measure fetal exposure to a drug. It's really difficult to do um, in vivo, but there are um, ex vivo tools um, that, that people are using now. There's uh, placental perfusion models, or they may obtain um, samples at, at, at birth to try, to try to model or try to determine what the potential uptake might be. And so um, that's continuing to evolve. I'm not an expert in that. I don't know if... Uh, if Khaled, Dr. Abdujali has a comment on that, but um, yes, that, that's where potentially where the PBPK modeling could be really useful, combined with maybe these in vitro or ex vivo tools. Yeah. And uh, there are questions regarding uh, if the bomb may be high to pass the like protein, will it cause or albumin, will it cause harm to the fetus? This actually depends on which critical window during development of the fetus. Uh, if it is during the uh, organ limited, then there is still some risk uh, there. But again, if, uh, this again uh, also depends on the affinity of the bomb to cause that type of toxicity if you uh, uh, frame it within the PD, like pharmacodynamic or toxicodynamic response. Uh, again, as I said, in, in terms of the beta, this is for the beta. For the beta, uh, uh, regarding the beta term, or I mean the, the children, this depends also on their characterization issue or not. That's from my side. Well, well, certainly that's something if you could do, you could certainly take a sample if you have a plasma sample from a patient, a, a healthy patient or a pregnant patient. It's just additional laboratory step to separate out the unbound concentration from the total. And so certainly you might want to confirm that if there's any, to, to verify what the fraction unbound is. 
to do that. The key point, though, is in the trachrolimus example, and Dr. Hebert's uh, publication confirms that, is that when you have a protein-bound molecule like trachrolimus, those the changes in binding don't aren't really clinically relevant, as I explained. But I mean, it would be it would be certainly important to verify the fraction unbound, and that could be easily determined experimentally using equilibrium dialysis or ultrafiltration. It's not a difficult thing to do. I would like to know what are your thoughts on highly bound drugs to AAG dosed by intravenously? Fetal newborn AAG levels are substantially lower compared to adults. Do you think there's a risk in that population? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I'd have to think about that. And potentially, I guess, if you do, I mean, I'm just speculating here, but if if that's the case where you have differences between the the, the mother and the fetus, with um, in terms of that um, unbound concentration, then potentially yes, you would get um, potentially higher exposure. If there are any unbound concentration in the in the mother, could potentially translate to a higher unbound concentration in the fetus. But um, but there's other factors as well. Does that medication actually cross the placenta and accumulate? In, in, in the fetus to begin with. And so there have to be a number of assumptions to make when evaluating that. But if there is, if there are lower AAG levels in the fetus and that you have a, a drug that binds to AAG, all things considered, potentially yes, that could maybe result in higher unbound levels in a fetus. But again, you'd have to consider other factors like the, uh, like the, the, the transfer, the placental transfer of the drug. Someone would like to know, is the Tamiflu dose given to pregnant women, was it given as milligrams per kilogram or the same dose in milligrams was given to all subjects? I believe it was a 75 milligram dose. It wasn't milligram per kilogram. I'd have to go back and look at the, at the reference, but I think it was a straight, it wasn't a, a, a body weight dose, corrected dose. Your simulation includes a postpartum population. What is known about the time course of changes returning back to normal? Well, in general, um, and I've, I've tried to review the literature on this, is that the general thinking is that most of the changes, the physiologic changes, should uh, revert back within about four to six weeks. And I'm talking about cardiovascular changes and other things. I do know, for example, there was an FDA guidance in 2004 that referred to the postpartum as after three months. And that's consistent with what um, at least the trichrolimus study involved. But again, it's not uh, constant for all women that potentially it may take a longer time. There might be variability in that. But in general, that's my general understanding that the postpartum period is about a month, month and a half, and that FDA documents and things suggest that more than three months would, would be a suitable time frame for where women physiologically revert back to normal. Looks to be our, our final question from our audience. Regarding the tacrolimus pregnancy PBPK model, did you, and if so, yes, how, consider the effect of organ transplantation surgery on AAG serum levels, which is generally known to increase AAG levels and thereby counteract the pregnancy-related decrease? I did not consider that, but, you know, it's known. I don't believe the model. I wouldn't know if the model considers that, but it's known that after surgery, that AAG levels increase. The question that I don't know is do they maintain that high after transplantation surgery? Because the women here, I would assume that if they were on tacrolimus, the surgery would have taken place months before they became pregnant. And so my general understanding is certainly surgery of any type of surgery would increase AAG levels, but they would tend, to, after surgery, I would expect that they would revert back to normal. If the case is true that uh, post post uh, transplant that these women continue to maintain high AAG levels. I'm not sure the model has actually built that in, but I I don't know the exact answer to that. Okay, thank you so much, David. We have had a really great discussion with our.